for the Republican Party that has pushed for judges who oppose Roe v. Wade, while many also still claim in confirmation hearings under oath that they have some kind of open mind. Well, this is about power. It's about installing judges who are likely against Roe, regardless of what they say, who are likely against women's rights on the courts. And Donald Trump's luck of the draw, combined with Mitch McConnell's unprecedented obstruction, led to Donald Trump, in one term, picking three justices. Meanwhile, nationally, the Congress is led by a woman speaker. And this current Congress has more women than ever before. It's a complex story when you look at power and gender. But down at the state level, many of these legislatures, which have been passing the rules I'm telling you about, they're run by Republican parties whose elected representatives are overwhelmingly men. The Mississippi law that the Supreme Court will review tomorrow, well, it passed with 89% of its support in the legislature from men. And by the way, in total, women are only about 15% of that state's lawmakers. The Alabama Senate recently passed an abortion ban with no exception for either rape or incest. It passed with 100% of its supporters in the legislature from the male column. Every single person that voted for that new restrictive rule was a man. Only four of the total 35 state senators are women there, actually. In Texas, as I mentioned earlier, men have outnumbered women in that legislature 30 to 1 over 200 years. An incredibly lopsided figure. So these are power dynamics that matter and gender inequities that matter. And as many of the experts and evidence show, are then carried out in ways that affect one gender more than the other. Three other states right now are planning to copy most of the Texas scheme. We expect that to happen very quickly if the Supreme Court greenlights it. And you should note, when you look at them, each state legislature that is talking about doing that on the conservative side dominated by male lawmakers. In Arkansas, men outnumber women three to one. In Florida, women are just a third of the lawmakers. Over in South Carolina, also talking about copying Texas, women are only 17% of the legislature. In South Dakota, women are only 28% of the lawmakers. The numbers are overwhelming. You can see them there, and they show who is making decisions for whom. This is an imbalance that technically the Supreme Court isn't really going to get into in tomorrow's hearings. It's something that is real, that everyone can see that's happening in our politics and in power, but something that the courts, at least when it comes to pro-choice laws, seem to just not even want to acknowledge. Now, it's something that Texas State Senator Wendy Davis acknowledged. She led that filibuster against a different anti-abortion law and has discussed the power imbalance. So many of these laws are written by men. They'll never suffer the consequences of their own actions. And women confront very sad realities. These bastards that are in office who are passing these laws deserve to be voted out. Davis, one of the lawmakers fighting to try to change this initially from the inside and clearly outnumbered. This is broader than a philosophical discussion about when one defines life. This is right now about breaking constitutional Supreme Court precedent despite People saying we live under the rule of law. It's about using powers to attack women's rights and choices. And a powerful group basically passing laws against another group, working against what is about half the population of the country. I mentioned Rachel briefly uh, earlier in the program. Here's a little more of what Rachel Maddow said about tomorrow's court case. We know what the purpose of this case is, and we know why Republicans picked the particular justices they picked to be on the Supreme Court. So it is, frankly, a matter now of preparing for a return to American women having to seek out illegal abortions instead of having the right to get one. We don't exactly know when the court will rule, but there are pretty grave expectations for what that ruling will mean. Where that ruling is headed and what it means begins formally before the Supreme Court tomorrow. Mississippi Republicans have lawyers who are prepared to argue tomorrow that the Supreme Court should not only uphold its ban, but also flat out end Roe v. Wade. Do it. Admit it. An explicit effort to end that 50-year precedent. In formal filings, they argue that Roe is, quote, egregiously wrong. Now, the justices could reject that or could find Mississippi's ban violated Roe's right to choice by limiting it so early. 
just as litigation over the Texas ban that I mentioned turns on whether that state's bounty scheme basically gives veto power over one woman's abortion to other citizens. That's how Justice Breyer put it in an earlier review over whether to initially halt the law. What else could happen? The court could uphold the ban while claiming it is not overruling Roe in its entirety. I mention that because that has been a kind of misleading rear guard legal attack on choice that many conservative legal, users, uh, legal leaders, I should say, have been using for some time. The court could also strike down this ban and just keep Roe v. Wade as law of the land. The administration running the DOJ decides the formal U.S. position in these kind of cases. We've had Neil Katyal on this and many other MSNBC programs. He was the person who did that in court for Obama as Solicitor General. And the Solicitor General reports up to the Attorney General. The new Attorney General, Merrick Garland, has been leading the opposition to these southern state bans and accuses them of simply defying, denying, and abrogating women's constitutional rights. The obvious and expressly acknowledged intention of this statutory scheme is to prevent women from exercising their constitutional rights. That is just legally true. That's not a debate. The Supreme Court has long ruled these are constitutional rights. In fact, few members of the court will openly say that they will just ignore precedent or reverse that. In fact, you may recall this from all the Supreme Court confirmation hearings, which get covered on TV and discussed around the country. It has become kind of a weird Baroque tradition for the even Republican appointees to say under oath all sorts of words about Roe being a type of settled precedent. I understand the importance of the precedent set forth in Roe v. Wade. I don't think that abortion or the right to abortion is, would change. Do you even think some, under of the Trump? some of the restrictions might I change? I think some of the restrictions would change. The Supreme Court of the United States has held in Roe v. Wade that um, a fetus is not a person. That's the law of the land. I accept the law of the land. That is the law of the land. All of that was recent. Much of it was under oath. And that's one reason why these conservative lawyers are trying to lob these pretty far-fetched legal arguments for the court to, and you know I try to keep it real with you, to overturn Roe without overturning Roe, which just means overturning Roe without admitting it, which is the kind of sleight of hand that we are accustomed to in politics, but the Supreme Court is supposed to be above, and its members certainly claim they are. As for accepting the law of the land, unlike other Rapidly shifting and divisive social debates, the public also accepts this as the law, too. Most Americans consistently believe abortion should be legal in most cases. Now, there are still earnest and validly held religious and personal objections to abortion. Anyone familiar with religious traditions knows about that. So how can both those things be true? Well, the data shows most Americans do not think that even those earnestly held concerns should then be enforced by the government, any more than most religious people demanding that the government enforce the Sabbath. That's just not a common view. America was founded with a separation of religion and state. We are not a theocracy. So where do we all go from here? Well, some legal experts think, as Rachel said, that it is now a matter of when the court goes forward supporting these abortion bans, not if. We don't know. We will follow the case and see where it lands. But if that is true, then the choice movement will have to focus less on the courts where precedents change over several decades and probably focus more on the ballot box where these laws are being drafted in the first place. Women are still half the nation, and pro-women's movements have been sparked by everything from the original calls for suffrage to Donald Trump's election by a male-dominated electoral plurality, not a majority, by the way, while Democratic women and women of color were crucial to the recent and record voter turnout in Georgia, which flipped two red Senate seats blue and also demoted Mitch McConnell, ending his sway over Supreme Court nominations. And by the way, a lot of that Georgia mobilizing was led by a rising woman in Southern politics, Stacey Abrams. Meanwhile, other elected women have continued to use their power not only to push reform and new laws, but to recount some personal stories in the Congress 
about abortions and women's rights and present this in public to their colleagues, to the voters, to try to make sure the reality for women is told by women and presented to everyone, in this case, by women in a position of power. Now, against the reality of these very high stakes for women, there is also a new and churlish refrain you may have heard from the anti-vaccine right that tries to troll and mock these long-standing and heartfelt issues opposing vaccines by saying, my body, my choice. Now, like so much of trolling on the right, it's a deliberately hypocritical bit of political theater. And yet, as policy, it also inadvertently reinforces the very gender discrimination at play that these groups are warning about and urging the Supreme Court to fight against. Because, again, I'm just going to try to tell it to you in reality, in plain English. In the vaccine fight, there aren't any states using government power to legally ban the choice to decline a vaccine in your body. Now, there are rules that might keep you out of a restaurant or a workplace, but it is most certainly your legal choice, man or woman, over your body to put a vaccine in it. But in Mississippi and Texas and this growing list of states, let's be clear. The men in power, I showed you, is overwhelmingly men, are already making it the opposite for women. The internal functioning of their bodies and medical choices is legally banned by the men in power. And if the Supreme Court continues to greenlight that against 50 years of precedent, the next revolution may come, if at all, at the ballot box in deciding who should be making these choices about freedom for other people.